The words that I would like to look at today are the words that we've been looking at at all the Lenten Sundays thus far from Matthew chapter 6 as we've been focusing on the Lord's Prayer. And today is the third petition of the Lord's Prayer. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And that's what we're going to be looking at today. God's will being done on earth as it is in heaven and how that applies to us. Please bow your heads and pray with me. Gracious God and Father, we thank you for including us in your will. Your will to save us through the blood of Jesus Christ, through his sacrifice on the cross, and your will to serve you on this side of eternity. Because we know that as we serve you on this side of eternity, our will is also coupled with the will of the saints who have gone before us as they carry it out, praising you and serving you. So use us on this side as we await the day when we are with you forever. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, words that are very common to us, a, a term that is used, I've, I've heard it from the time I was a kid. In fact, I've used the term many times myself, and I think you have too. It's God's will. Got that? It's God's will. And usually it's said at a time when people are kind of sighing, it's God's will. And it's sometimes done in a situation that the people feel totally out of control. It's God's will. And as they say it, we're not quite sure whether they are trusting that it is God's will or whether they're kind of blaming God for all of this happening. Let me tell you a time when that term, that phrase, it's God's will, really angered me. I was 17 years old. My father had died unexpectedly of a heart attack. Our family was in shock and a lot of things needed to be done. And then at the funeral home, I am standing in front of the coffin with my father's body inside, looking at him. And someone standing right over here, kind of in back of me and to my side, said with a sigh, it's God's will. And it was almost as though the hair on the back of my neck stood up. Because I thought, what kind of a God would kill my father? Do I want anything to do with a God who would kill my father? Well, I realized years down the road that I was more German Lutheran than not, and therefore, as I look back on that, I too would, well, it was God's will. But it took me 35 years later to understand how God's will was worked through those events that took place that day because I buried it as I buried him and didn't revisit it again and couldn't see how any good could come, could come out of that for 35 years until I looked back and I saw how God used that in spite of it for his good, for my good. You know, when we deal with God's will, it still bugs me a bit. Is death, the death especially of God's saints, really God's will? I don't think it is. I'm more and more convinced that death is not God's will. Instead, it wasn't God's will at the Garden of Eden, and it isn't His will today. Life is God's will, abundant life and everlasting life. That's His will. Then whose will is it when a loved one dies? Well, there are other wills working against God's will, and we're going to be getting into that, especially today during the sermon. But just briefly, there are three wills that work against God's will. The will of Satan, the prince of this present darkness. You heard about that in the readings already. The will of the world that also wanders around in that darkness and prefers the darkness more than the light. And the will of our own sinful, dead in trespasses and sins, flesh of ours so then 
Where does God's will fit into all of this? The will of Satan brings sickness, pain, and death. The will of the world brings chaos, wars, and famine. And our own will sets us up as number one on our own throne in our heart. But God's will is worked through all that Satan, the world, and our flesh cause to bring a blessing for his people through what that event might have been and also in spite of that being worked. On these Sundays in Lent, we've been looking at the Lord's Prayer. Today, we're looking at that third petition, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So before we talk about God's will, it's imperative for us to understand just what is the good and gracious will of God. And sometimes we complicate the meaning of God's will. But that's what sinners do. We try to focus God's will upon our own personal life. We try to struggle and find out what God's will is for me. And in so doing, we miss the true understanding and the full understanding of what the good and gracious will of God is all about. So I'm going to base this sermon around four questions. They're not questions that I have created. In fact, if you want to do further study, look in your catechism, because this is how Luther approaches it as well. What is God's good and gracious will? And now we have some repetition from the previous weeks when we talked about hallowing his name and his kingdom coming. It is God's will that his name be kept holy, kept holy among us kept holy as witness to the world. That's his will, and that is his will, keeping his name holy on earth as it is in heaven. It's God's will that his kingdom come as it is in heaven, so it is on earth. And it comes when God's word is taught correctly. First Corinthians chapter 1 has the apostle Paul making a powerful stand against the whole world, saying the Jews demand signs, the Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews, a folly to the Gentiles, but to those who are being called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. He did not apologize for the message. We preach Christ crucified, whether you stumble over it or you think it's ridiculous, we preach Christ crucified. The word taught correctly. It comes also when sinners are brought to faith in Christ and we hear Jesus saying in John chapter 6, my father's will is that everyone who looks to the son and believes in him shall have eternal life. And I will raise him up at the last day. It is God's will that all people be saved. That John 6 is coupled right with John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. That will of the Father brought agony to the soul of Jesus there in the Garden of Gethsemane. So much agony that he sweat drops of blood as he struggled with what it meant for the Father to give his only Son. And then he prayed, My Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. The cost of redemption was his very lifeblood, and he knew it, and he drank the cup. Whose will and plans are opposed to God's will? I already mentioned that, but I'm going to talk about it more. The devil works to frustrate God's will. The devil does it so subtly. He twists the word of God as a way to ensnare us and to entangle us. He twisted God's word to Eve and he led her astray. In Genesis 3, he says in his little twisting of the words, half-truths here, half-truths there, and a bold lie in the middle. Did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? You shall not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. 
He attempted to entrap Jesus himself in the wilderness after his baptism as he was led out by the Spirit to be tempted by the devil. In Matthew chapter 4, the devil, in response to Jesus countering his one temptation with the Word of God, change this stone into bread if you're the Son of God. Man does not live by bread alone, Jesus said, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And so the devil said, I'll use his word against him. And so he took him to the high point of the temple, set him up there. And he said, now, throw yourself down because the word says he will command his angels concerning you. And on their hands, they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone trying to ensnare even Jesus Christ. And Jesus countered, you shall not tempt the Lord your God with something so ridiculous, so useless. But the devil is a sore loser. Luke adds one verse to the, his temptation account that is not in Matthew's gospel. It's a verse that kind of brings trembling to me sometimes. And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him. I'm good with that. Until an opportune time. That's what scares me. We all have opportune times that the devil is looking for an opportune time to bring about his devilish plan of leading us away from God. The world is also opposed to God's will because the world is in the pocket of Satan. The world whittles down God's word to make it fit to be politically correct, it loves to stumble in the darkness, and it loves to have people led deeper into the darkness. And we ourselves, our sinful flesh, we frustrate God's will as well, like the Israelites, frustrating God's plans, and he punished them for 40 years wandering around in the wilderness, and then when they continued to gripe about all the blessings that he gave them, the manna from heaven, the quail that came to them, were sick of this food, he sent poisonous serpents among them. But in every situation, when God punished, he also provided healing. Set the bronze serpent on a pole in the midst of the camp, and anyone who looks to that will find life. We focus on what makes us happy and feels good. By nature, we like to have the spotlight shining on us, and we desire our comfort instead of doing God's will. We're as guilty as the Israelites. That's why I never clean that shed out in my backyard because of poisonous snakes that might be sent. But I'm taking volunteers. Why do we pray for God's will to be done? The fact is that God does not need us for his will to be done. God's will shall be done even without our prayer because he's God. He desires us to pray for his will to be done so that we can become a part of doing his will. He wants to share the blessing with us. As his people, we pray that his will be done in our lives. What's the old, be a doer of the word and not a hearer only? His word refers to us as Paul writes, for we are his workmanship. You heard that in Ephesians chapter 2. You heard how we were dead in trespasses and sin, how we were saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And then that verse 10, so powerful, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. That's the will of God, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That's doing God's will. As God's workmanship, we are called into action for Christ. We pray that all evil will be hindered that try to, tries to block his will. And we pray that we will stand there with him and not in the way of his will. How is God's will done in our lives? That's the, the last question that is asked in the catechism. When he breaks all plans that work to block his will, that's when God's will is done in our lives. The devil and the world we to work to destroy and weaken our faith, and yet we have a promise in Romans 16, verse 20, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet, and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you.
And we have an assurance also from Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 1. I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him for that day. Our own sinful flesh works so often to destroy our faith, and yet we remember in 1 Peter chapter 1, you through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. We are shielded by God's power because we are his children. We are washed in the waters of baptism. We are covered with his grace. We are shielded by God's power until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And how we call in that prayer from Psalm 119, direct me in the path of your commands, for there I find delight. God's will is done in our lives when he strengthens and keeps us firm in the faith. You know, I don't know how many people have come to me throughout my ministry, kind of sighing and moaning a little bit, saying, I don't know what God's will is for my life. Maybe you've asked that question yourself. My friends, we're God's children. Quit asking yourself the question and quit asking other people the question. And don't ask your pastor, what is God's will for my life? <laughs> you know what God's will is. You are in God's will. You are a grace-covered child of God. You are already in His will. Just do it. Just do it. That's all you have to do. No matter what you are doing, whether you study God's word, you are in his will. That's his will being done through you. You come to worship, you are doing God's will. When you help with the altar guild, when you do LWML stuff, you are in God's will. When you are about the Father's business, no matter how trivial it might be, Luther even said the maid who washes the floors for her family. It's in God's will as she calls upon Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior. And so we also are in God's will. And we are doing God's will when we realize that God supports us until we die. That's how powerful His grace is and how long-lasting it is until we die. And then we do His will in heaven. We've got to be cautious when we use the term with a sigh, it's God's will. Cautious that we're not blaming God for a bad situation. Cautious that we're not expressing more doubt than trust when we're saying it. God's good and gracious will is for the kingdom to come through us. As our faith grows, we trust that all things work together for good, even the death of my father. All things work together for good to those who love the Lord. As our faith grows and we are in the will of God and we understand that we're in His will, we know too that His grace is sufficient for me and that when I'm at my weakest, His power is made perfect in that weakness. We are in the will of God when we are able ourselves to say by the power of the Holy Spirit, for me to live as Christ, to die as gain. Yes, it is. May God's Holy Spirit so work within you that you rejoice in doing God's will, for you are in it already by His grace. Amen. Now may that peace that surpasses all human understanding keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.